musicians have access to tools that allow us to create pretty much every sound we can you know, think or dream of, doesn't it feel like a limitation to stick to an instrument that is, well, essentially a piece of wood with some strings on it without that's any... The, that's the magic of it as mm. well. I mean, the, the sound is not super long, but this decay is also magical and uh, just with your fingers you can change the sound a lot, like just by position of the hand or the, the fingernails or, or everything. So you have a lot of freedom in this way with uh, just a piece of wood, as you say, and some strings. So uh, no, I don't think it's uh, too much of a limitation. Is there really no trace of sort of a minimalist um, aesthetic to creating these sounds out of, well, just your fingers and, 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 and the strings? It's been a few years actually that I've been searching, but recently we came up with, uh, with this instrument that we could call today a Braillute, or uh, which is a lute uh, that would have the sound of uh, the harp with bray pins. The first idea came from uh, from Capirola, from uh, the instructions uh, in the beginning of this uh, manuscript where uh, Vidal, uh, the student of Capirola, uh, speaks about how to set up the instrument, he speaks about the strings and different things, and at some point, towards the end of his instructions, he uses this word arpizza, and it's difficult to imagine something else than, uh, I mean, the, the frets close to the strings make this buzzing sound, of course, that we are always trying to avoid. Uh, of course, with our idea of uh, classical guitar or uh, like today's sound should be as pure as possible, but probably what they were searching at the time was not the, was not this. The bray lute is a bit like having a distortion with your lute. Already the double strings make kind of a chorus effect and uh, maybe having extra basses makes you the, the reverb. So you already have an electric guitar with you. <laughs> but anyway, I've been studying jazz and uh, that was my uh, entry into like more professional studies of music. And uh, then when I came here actually to study in Geneva with, with uh, Dusan Bogdanovic, the idea was really to, to work more on this combination of improvisation, in, but also in classical music actually, in, in Western classical music. I can't imagine music without improvisation, really, and we can see in all the, the world music traditions that it's present. And uh, if we do little research in Western classical tradition, we can also see that it was present till the 20th century, at least till the beginning of 20th century. Then, at some point, it disappeared. So I started a research project some six years ago. Doing more and more research, I found out that actually this was really very common. It's sure that all these people were improvising and uh, we can imagine how they were improvising these fantasias. So one of the axes of research that I was doing was, was this, and that I'm still doing actually. Thank you. 
improvising, how does your mind work? Is there some general thought process, uh, some, some mental image that you have, uh, that you're thinking about? There is one thing that is uh, important uh, when structuring your, uh, your improvisation is the, the idea of a general discourse. It's a bit like speaking to people, but just improvising what you're saying. I mean, just uh, it's what we are doing all the time, of course, when we are talking. We are not, uh, we don't learn what we have to say, what I have to say to you. No. your vocabulary, you have your uh, that, the, all these techniques and uh, the words you are using is the different phrases, notes, models. just one of the possible aesthetics and uh, I'm not the first one to, to search for these kind of things but uh, it's true that the general aesthetic of the lute is just like a very nice pure and uh, uh, sweet sound. The guitarist at the beginning starting playing the lute had a less round and sweet sound but at the same time when the first generation of real lutenists, let's say, wanted to distinguish themselves from guitarists, they, they cut the, the, the fingernails and they started playing with this sweet round sound. We know from a, from a letter of uh, Castiglione, when he was visiting Rome, that uh, he saw da Milano playing uh, with two thimbles into which he puts uh, quills. So that made me think also what, what, is this, what are these symbols and how he was playing with that. You mentioned Francesco da Milano, this famous uh, lute player. So this sort of um, a letter like this sort of extends our view on him because he is sort of regarded as a bit of a schoolmaster almost mm. of lute playing. But then to imagine someone like this using, yeah, again, these effects, preparing his lute in a way. Mm. I, have, I think it's completely normal. Anyway, he, he was born, in, well, in the very end of 15th century when there was still a different tradition. We know that people were using plectrum technique at least till the 20s, um, probably more, who knows, but... Uh, the 1520s. Yes, <laughs> the 1520s.
have already reached the end of this episode, but as always, I reserved some time to also speak on some personal things. And uh, this time it really was kind of a unique episode in how it came about. I suppose it fits the general topic it covered, an improvised episode in a way. Usually uh, these memo episodes are made along a pretty well-defined script, but uh, this time I just uh, took the way down to Geneva where Borsuljan works and lives and well we had a lot of time to talk play music together improvise and what you saw now is uh, sort of a distillation of all the footage that i collected uh, well about a month ago the reason why all this material had been sitting on my hard drive for so long is that these last weeks and months uh, were really quite dense in terms of uh, concerts and other work-related uh, things, which uh, well, for a musician is of course good news, but it also means that there was hardly any free time in between to really sit down and, and focus on uh, on working on this video. And I figured it's better to really take the time and, and put out sort of the best uh, product I can, as opposed to just sort of rushing things. Uh, in the meantime, just last week, Bor Suljan released his most recent CD, which I happen to have right here. On it, he collaborated with his ensemble La Lira and the Italian singer Pino De Vittorio. And it features music by the lutenist Giacomo Gorzanis, which doesn't mean that it's all lute music. In fact, it's uh, mostly songs. You heard some of the instrumental excerpts uh, in the background of this video and all I want to say now is that I can really recommend having a closer look. Uh, I gave the CD a couple of spins these last days and um, it's, it's a good time. If you would like to have a listen first, it is actually available on Spotify, but in case you enjoy the music, please really do consider making a purchase either digitally or on Amazon. Uh, it really means direct support to the artists, which uh, leads us to the most important point of this final section of the video, which is, of course, my moment to thank all the people who make this project Memo possible. And that's, of course, you, all of you, but especially those of you who decided to support Memo via Patreon. Even during these last busy weeks, the number of supporters has actually been rising steadily and it's really supporters from around the globe. As you can see here, uh, I think we are now up to 24 different countries, which just uh, keeps blowing my mind. And the concept behind all of this is that each patron uh, chooses a uh, small amount, for example, the price uh, for a cup of coffee in their home country. And uh, this amount is then donated to the project whenever I release a new episode. So it's quite flexible. If I don't really have the time to put out more episodes uh, for a couple of days or weeks, then uh, it won't mean people are charged for nothing. There's always a charge for actual delivered content, but the hope is that eventually this um, sum will reach uh, a certain uh, amount that will enable me to really um, reserve more and more time to uh, devote to working on these videos. So it's an ongoing effort. But what's continuous throughout is my thanks to everyone who is involved right now and uh, Apart from the money itself, it's, it's just the, the gesture alone of supporting a project like this that uh, really means very much to me. So thanks to all of you. Furthermore, I would like to express my gratitude towards Memo's first sponsor for the special support. It's the online string service Cuerdas Pulsadas. And on their website, you can find all kinds of strings, not only loot strings, but strings for virtually any stringed instrument. And since they offer certain timed discounts, it really pays off to go and have a look at their website from time to time. I put a link down there. If you are considering becoming a patron to Memo yourself or would simply like to learn more about the project, you can find all previous episodes as well as more information on Memo's own website, which is musicamemo.com. 
There you'll also find a way to sign up to Memo's own newsletter, which will inform you by email whenever I release a new episode. Well, all that's really left to say at this point is that I hope you enjoyed this installment and that you'll be joining me again for the upcoming episode of Memo. Thank you.